In this video, we want to talk about dead reckoning as a way of navigation. So we want to look at it in one dimension, and then we want to look at it in multiple dimensions. So the learning outcomes for this module, which is about inertial guidance actually, are to explain the principles of inertial navigation systems and explain the sources of error in inertial navigation systems. So dead reckoning helps us establish the concepts that the principles of inertial navigation are built on. Dead reckoning is based on the old idea, this is uh, uh, <laughs> as old as people have been navigating successfully. If you know your starting position and you can maintain constant velocity, meaning your speed and your heading, you ought to be able to figure out where your position will be after some time interval. Now, of course, you're not really going to maintain constant velocity and there's going to be other factors, but let's uh, understand what would happen in the ideal case and then we can start to deal with the less than ideal cases. So we'll do a one-dimensional problem starting at a point x naught, and assuming you have a constant velocity v over an interval of duration cap t. I think you all know the answer to this. Here's our velocity profile. It's constant over the interval cap t. If the velocity is constant, then we're going to add uh, a distance v times cap t to the initial distance and get our new position x1. And really, if you think about it, you know, you can do this incrementally. As long as the velocity is constant, the position is going to be increasing uh, uh, at that same rate v everywhere uh, times small increments of t. So the slope of the position line is going to be the derivative, uh, uh, will be the velocity itself. So the slope of that line uh, on the right, the uh, diagonal going between x0 and x1, uh, would be uh, v. And so V times cap T gives you the, how much extra you add to uh, X naught to get to X1. So here's a problem. You got an aircraft. It's at 46 north, uh, 90 west. It's flying due south for 30 minutes at 120 knots. And then it turns instantaneously. Again, simple uh, toy problems first and then uh, real problems. And flies due east for 30 minutes at 120 knots. What's the final lat long? Well, going 120 knots at, uh, uh, in 30 minutes, you're going 60 nautical miles. And on a parallel, uh, then one uh, minute of arc corresponds to one nautical mile, right? Along uh, the prime meridian, uh, along any of the meridians, uh, one nautical mile and one minute of arc should be the same thing. So if we've gone 60 minutes, or 60 nautical miles, we've gone 60 minutes of arc, and that should correspond to a change of a one degree, basically. So our new latitude is 45 degrees. Now we know that along lines of longitude, a minute of arc is uh, not as long as a one nautical mile. It gets shorter the further north you go, because you get close to the uh, uh, North Pole, and you have to go <laughs> uh, 360 degrees of arc in a very short, say you're just standing a meter away from the North Pole, you've got a, 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 a very short circle there that you have to go through a, a 360 degrees of. So it changes with the cosine of the angle of latitude. So at 45 degrees, uh, uh, one minute of arc ought to be uh, uh, one over uh, root two, 0.707 nautical miles. So we can take our 60 uh, nautical miles and divide it by 0.707 nautical miles and then multiply that by uh, what uh, would have been one minute of arc. And so we've gone through 84.85 minutes of arc, actually, which is one degree and 24.85 minutes. And you could correspond, you could take that 0.85 uh, minutes and turn that into minutes and seconds. Uh, or turn that into the 0.85 minutes and turn that into seconds. Uh, uh, so the new position is 44, uh, 45 north, excuse me, uh, 87 degrees, uh, uh, 35.15 minutes east. So what if your velocity is not constant? Well, in that formula on the previous slide, that product VT is actually the integral velocity uh, over time from zero to cap T. The velocity just happened to be constant. So integrals are just areas under the curve. So here's a velocity profile. Uh, and, and now uh, to get to the velocity, the, the position at x1 will be the integral uh, under that triangle uh, with that height, ends up, at, uh, altitude, uh, ends up at a velocity vt, starts at a velocity zero and increases linearly 
uh, to a velocity vt over the duration cap t. So that area is just one half vt uh, times cap t squared. And so uh, in that case, uh, the position will increase like a parabola. I haven't shown that here, but you can uh, imagine the position instead of increasing constantly, as in the previous slide would increase like a, a, a quadratic, uh, it's increasing faster uh, uh, the further into this you go because the velocity is getting bigger. The other way to look at that is the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity and the derivative is just slope of the line. So this is a constant uh, acceleration situation. So if we were constantly accelerating, then our velocity is increasing linearly and our position is increasing quadratically. So uh, this is just the concept. Again, we can do this in multiple dimensions. If we had an x component of velocity and a y component of velocity, uh, we would just, again, and, and again, we're assuming they're constant over the interval from zero to cap t. So again, you just have an increment in the x position, you have uh, in, in the x direction, you have an increment in the y direction. And we can do that in vector notation here uh, just by putting x and y into vectors. So we start at the initial point p, we have a, a velocity, uh, uh, vector v uh, and we just multiply the vector velocity times cap t uh, to get the increment in the position to get our new position. So here's a problem where we can employ that. We've got a, a, a an occupied surface vehicle, a robot. It's got it only goes 10 knots. You turn it on, it goes 10 knots whatever direction you point. No thrusters, no nothing, no heading. It just goes 10 knots forward. It's goes forward very successfully, it doesn't, doesn't meander. And you want to cross a stream that flows five knots due north, uh, and we want to end up on the other side. So we're going to start, we want to go, this stream flows directly north. So we're going to go, we're going to end up directly across from where we are. And that means, you know, we'd like to have, uh, uh, we, we're just going to put it in the water and give it a heading psi. Uh, and then, uh, so we need to figure out the angle psi to put it in the water with. Uh, so that we can get it to the other side directly across where the uh, uh, y component, y1, is equal to the uh, original y component, but the x component is the x on the other side. Okay, so we want the north-south component of the velocity to be zero. The north-south component of the velocity with a heading psi is going to be 10 times the sine of psi. Uh, and then we want to add that to the five knots due north. Uh, and we want to get nothing. And so that means that the sine of psi has to be minus a half, which means that psi is minus 30 degrees, meaning we're pointing towards the velocity. You know that already. You, you looked at that diagram and said, Wilson, your V is in the wrong direction. It ought to be pointing uh, towards the five knots to get, a, to, uh, to get the motion to go across in the east and west. That's correct. And it worked out mathematically that it is minus 30 degrees. So the speed towards the target would be 10 times the cosine of minus 30, which is the same time as the cosine of 30, which is going to be uh, uh, the cosine of 30 is root 3 over 2, right? There's three, there's a couple of tricks, you know, you ought to know, you ought to know the sine and cosine of 30 degrees and the sine and cosine of 45 degrees and, and the sine and cosine of 0 and 90 degrees, of course. But beyond that, that's really, I mean, you can figure the rest of them out pretty much after that, approximate pretty good and everything. So. Uh, root 3 over 2 is 0.866, so the thing's going 8.66 knots in the east-west direction. So that's it for uh, dead reckoning. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, pilots have all kinds of tools to, to do this, so they can take the uh, uh, wind velocity and uh, vector it in with their desired airspeed and location to do exactly what we just did with that little boat example, figure out what heading they should be flying to go the direction they really want to go. Uh, so we combine knowledge of position and constant speed and constant heading uh, uh, to estimate where we're going to be. And so we want to take that back to that little example we had with the accelerations now. What if instead of knowing the velocities and assuming they were constant, we just measured the accelerations? If we know our starting point, we ought to be able to measure our accelerations, integrate the acceleration to get the velocity, and then integrate the velocity to get the position. Uh, and so in the next lecture, we'll explore that uh, and we'll explore uh, 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 the implications of that. Uh, what happens if your acceleration uh, measurement is noisy? Uh, what happens if your acceleration measurement is biased? Uh, and we'll explore what the differences between those two situations are. So uh, that's dead reckoning. It's pretty straightforward, and I think, uh, I hope you all find it uh, easy to do.